So we're on our second class now on a question of redemption. Can the modern state of Israel be the beginning of redemption? Uh, last week, we began uh, with really the source of this book. Um, and this week, we're going to begin the introduction of this book right? mm -hmm. on page 17. Ever since the Zionist movement began some 200 years ago, many people have risen against it. This was true even when great rabbis like Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Kalsher and Rabbi Yehuda Alkali and Rabbi Eliyahu Gutmacher promoted the cause. 64 years before Herzl published his famous Dear Judenstadt, the, Judas, the Jewish state, the Zionist idea had already begun to take hold and take form and stimulate ideological debate. So one of the myths about Zionism is that it's a secular movement. Mm -hmm. right? um, and we're going to see now that the religious Zionist movement predated the secular movement. And the secular mm -hmm. movement may have been an answer to the failure of the religious movement. The early antagonists were motivated mainly by a fundamental opposition to the concept of natural redemption. So we learned last week that the, the history of the yearning for Zion begins before we're a nation. There was a promise made to Abraham mm -hmm. that the Jews in Egypt uh, already were yearning for. And the purpose of leaving Egypt was inevitably to come to this land of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, of the promise to be fulfilled. On the way, they would become a nation, they would come to Sinai. Right? But this desire for a land of milk and honey, for, for all that it could be, was something that had always been there. And it returned over and over and over as the nation was displaced in Babylon and then in Rome. It never ended. However, there seems to have been a sociological and a historical change that by the time the Roman uh, exile began, when the people said, as we say every year, even today, next year, next year in Jerusalem, they believed that there was a good chance that their children would celebrate Pesach the next year in Jerusalem with the temple rebuilt. It had happened after Babylon. <coughs> But over time, that changed. And we know that when our grandparents and great-grandparents said next year in Jerusalem, it was a prayer, but it wasn't really a belief. They didn't really believe that Symbolic. it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It was a prayer. It was a prayer. It was a wish. And a prayer, a prayer really is dependent on God answering your prayer. Miracles are involved. With it. And so a theology grew up which is not in the Torah. Theology grew up that we're prohibited from going back to the land, that there are oaths taken, derived from the Song of Songs, Shir Hashirim, that you shouldn't awaken in God the desire to return us to Israel before our time. <clears throat> and that we're excluded from returning to Israel by force, by numbers, without the permission of the, the nations that keep us in exile, uh, and that they're responsible to treat us not too abusively. And little by little, the process developed that there was a concept that we cannot do it ourselves. We cannot return ourselves. And should somebody try to do it, what do you mean we can't do it ourselves? That we cannot take the land back. Oh. Right? And should somebody try to do it, they're in violation of halacha. Mm -hmm. Violation of halacha. An individual could go and make aliyah, become a farmer, become a merchant, become a rav, whatever, right? But not to have sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Not to have a Jewish country. Mm -hmm. right? This was a violation of halacha. And it came to be understood by the vast, vast majority of Jews in Europe 
that the only way that we could have sovereignty again was by a open miracle. Mm -hmm. That Mashiach would arrive on a cloud, that the temple would drop from the sky mm -hmm. onto the Temple Mount, right? This is how it happened. In any other way, was really a violation of the law. So much so that if you were alive in the 1930s and the 1940s um, and you said, we need to make Aaliyah, you would have been very lonely. lonely. Very lonely. If you were a from Jew and you said, we need to make Aaliyah, <coughs> we need to have a country of our own, right? You would have been a very lonely person, right? Because the Frum community was hostile. It would be like, have, let's have a, you know, a hamburger with cheese. It was a because violation of halacha. It's a violation right. of halacha. Right. Let's have whole nations, right. you know, the, transgress the, the, halacha. The Frum community was not divided about, it's a myth, it wasn't really divided about um, Zionism. It was against it. David, can I ask you a question about yep. what you're talking about right now? What about the people who were coming when uh, 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 Montefiore and uh, all the big uh, machas, all the big, uh, buying, buying, pieces, buying yeah. pieces of land and settling people who were coming to Israel, were they, Jew were they religious? Who were they settling? Huh? Who were they settling? No, right. lots of people they were they when, the, when the people they, of the Gra they, went, they, when the people of Chabad went, they didn't go to create a nation. They went no, to I'm community. Not, I'm, not, I'm not saying they were building community. The issue is sovereignty. It was like in the sovereignty is the issue. Sovereignty is the issue, and this is what you have to understand: the is that nobody is hostile okay. to the idea of Eretz Yisrael. Okay. It's Medina Yisrael. Medina. Okay. Right? I got it. Everybody thinks Eretz Yisrael is right. our gift. We should live in Eretz Yisrael under the Sultan. Mm -hmm. You know, we should live <coughs> under the Ottoman Emperor. Right? Heaven forbid we should live under a Jewish sovereign nation that isn't a Torah nation. Right? Isn't a Torah nation. Better, right? So what we see today with Norte Carta, mm -hmm. and we world. think this is terrible, right? Yeah. First of all, they hold very similar beliefs to many, many people today. You should know that. Many people, they're not alone, number one. Number two, and, and their basic belief, right, is if it's not a Torah nation, it shouldn't exist. Better we should live under Palestinians than under a non-Torah Jewish nation. That's really the essence of the argument. It's the essence of the argument, right? And it is a pervasive argument, much more than you realize, much more than you accept. But they, but uh, but they, but not only Carter, they hate Israel in the form it is today. They That's hate right. It. That's right. And they want annihilation of Israel. That's right, of uh, the sovereignty of Israel under non-religious Jews, as they perceive it. So let's read. This was actually the norm. This was the norm prior to the war. You should know that. Right? And we're going to see why it is that it was not religious Jews who were willing to give up their lives for a sovereign state. It's a very curious thing. Mm -hmm. Why would they do it? They didn't identify with religion, <clears throat> and yet they were willing to do it. And many questions are raised by this. Right. Some of them we dealt with generally in the previous class. We're going to deal with it specifically now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the early antagonists were motivated mainly by a fundamental opposition to the concept of natural redemption. They believe that we are forbidden to do anything to hasten redemption. Instead, we must sit back and wait for God to perform miracles on our behalf. In their opinion, the only efforts we are permitted to make were spiritual ones, like prayer and studying the laws relating to the temple service. Some rabbis claim that the mitzvah to dwell in the land of Israel does not apply nowadays. There's no mitzvah to do. Mm -hmm. The issue of the three oaths also came up on occasion, along with practical concerns. Worried that, mo uh, worried that monetary support for a Zionist enterprise would deplete their sources of income for yeshivas in Eretz Israel and bring about their ultimate demise. So the question was, gee, you know, should we be spending money on creating a state? It'll take money away from yeshivas. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't do that, right? Now, 
we're all familiar with the three oaths at this point. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with it? Well, well, the three oaths derive from the repeated statement in three times in uh, Shir Shirim, in which uh, the Chasim, who is Hashem, tells the Kala, who is uh, Kla Yisrael, mm -hmm. right? I adjure you, I, I, I tell you, I demand of you, I beg you, mm -hmm. do not try to hasten my love. Mm -hmm. From this we came to a conclusion, the, the Chazal came to a conclusion, uh, that this means that we are forbidden to rush our um, renewed sovereignty of the nation. And the three oaths represent three specific requirements, oaths that it said God took. Uh, in terms of us. Oath number one, we are prohibited to go en masse to the land, mm -hmm. right? Prior to it becoming our country, mm -hmm. right? We can't have move as a wall to Eretz Israel. Right? Oath number two, right? It's required that the nations of the world must approve the Jewish return to Eretz Israel. Oath number two. Mm -hmm. Oath number three. Oath number three is that the nations, while we are in exile in their countries, cannot treat us too harshly. That is to say, slavery is permitted, and all that goes with it, but murder, genocide, genocide that crosses the line. So let's look at those three oaths. Okay. First of all, the issue of treating us harshly, I don't think there's a conversation. The Shoah is the end of this conversation. It's one word. Say so Shoah, that's done. Right? Second oath. Second oath. The nations of the world, uh, of the, the nations of the world, must agree that the Jews should return to Eretz Israel. Right? So San Remo Agreement, Balfour Declaration, finally the UN vote. Right? Mm -hmm. Clearly, at the time, Whatever the reasons, and it was a miraculous thing, we can talk about it some other time, the nations of the world wanted us to return to Eretz Israel. They voted in favor of it. They stated it favorably, both during the colonial times and post-colonial times. Third question is mass aliyah. Right? Well, the truth of the matter is there was no mass aliyah. It was by dribs and drabs. During the entire war, 35,000 Jews got into Palestine. Well, six million were being killed. Thirty-five thousand were permitted by the Brits to enter what was then Palestine. God knows how many people didn't have to die because of that. They were turned away. There was a mass aliyah, but it was only after the nation was created not prior to it. Mm -hmm. It was a result of a, of a statement of the creation of the nation by Ben-Gurion. The Jews of every Arab country were kicked out with the shirts on their back if they were lucky. Where to go? There was only one place in the Middle East to go. It was Israel. So at that time there was a large absorption of people who were kicked out of their countries, the, the countries in which they'd lived for a thousand years, their families. <clears throat> but that was after the nation was created. Mm -hmm. So each of these oaths during the early uh, 20th century were fulfilled. Country was created, not nation. What? Country was created. You said nation was created. Formal nation state. Mm -hmm. Nation state. No, Formal no, nation state. When in 1948, when the yeah. declaration mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Right. At that point, the Arab world went to war with Israel and mm -hmm. kicked out their Jewish citizens. Mm -hmm. You were going to say? No, no but uh, the settling by the religious people started much prior. We'll come but to it, this. But it wasn't... Uh, we'll come to this. It was very minor. We'll come to it in a second. What about all the... Listen, the, listen to the history of it. It's uh, time to learn some history. Serious. Time to learn some history. Hang on for the... Let's not debate. Let's see... Let's look at let's look so at the numbers. It's a, it's let's a, look it's at the, a country? Oh. rather than have a debate right now. Can we look at the numbers? Thank right. you. Okay, we'll come to it. I promise you, we'll come no, to it. No. Others opposed the movement because they felt that the entire issue was completely irrelevant. 
Who could even entertain the thought of establishing a Jewish state by natural means? The Gentiles would never allow us to do such a thing. Therefore, they reasoned, rallying world Jewry to this cause was nothing more than a delirious and utterly inconceivable dream. And there was actually substantial reasons to hold this view. Of all the views, it's actually the most reasonable one to me. Who thinks that the Jews are going to get a country, right, in this anti-Semitic world? Many books have been written in response to these claims, but we will not deal with them in the framework of this book. Perhaps we will summarize the main points sometime in the future, God willing. Mm -hmm. The harbingers of religious Zionism called upon the Jewish people to return to their homeland, but their call went largely unanswered. Not unlike, by the way, the experience of Ezra and Nehemiah. 10% of the Jews of Babylon mm -hmm. returned with them, and they were not the cream of the crop at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. There were a few very special people, but the vast majority they were... decided to stay in Babylon. The mm -hmm. vast majority yeah. of people who went with Ezra and Nehemiah mm -hmm. were not Shabbos observant. Mm -hmm. Many of them <coughs> didn't speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Many of them were married to foreign wives. Mm -hmm. Right. That was what Ezra and Nehemiah were living with. Not so different. Not so different. Right? The harbingers of religious Zionism called on the Jewish people to return to their homeland, but their call went largely unanswered. It is important to emphasize that most Jews who remained in the diaspora did so not out of a fundamental or ideological opposition to Aliyah. Diaspora life was essential was an established fact. While mass immigration to a primitive land seemed to be extremely difficult, if not an impossible undertaking. The relatively orderly life in Chutzarts was far easier than draining swamps and contending with the ruling powers in Eretz Israel and establishing a national political leadership. Very few people came to dwell on the land, leaving the vast majority of Jews in the diaspora. Okay? Well, let's look at what happened. Okay? The Enlightenment. Right? At the same time that Reb Kalash and Reb Alkali were laying the groundwork, we're talking in this case um, of people living in the late 1800s, Rob's of the 1800s, let's see. It says that uh, Rav Alkali lived from 1798 to 1879, Kalasher from 1795 to 1874. These were the early leaders of Jewish Zionism, right? Religious okay, Zionism. Uh, of religious Zionism. Thank you. you so really at this, that that's really later. Really that's really later. Really hold on, hold on. Don't trip ahead. At the same time, the the Kalasher and Rav Alkali laying the groundwork for redemption, another movement arose in the Jewish world. As a result of the French Revolution and other major upheavals taking place throughout Europe, thousands of Jews established the Haskalah Enlightenment movement. Mm -hmm. Among the many progressive and modern values that they advocated was Jewish assimilation, which they believed was the only answer to anti-Semitism. This was a new idea. Why was it a new idea? Assimilation, the idea of assimilation really began, we, we know, during the Hanukkah story, actually during Hellenism, mm -hmm. the idea of being Absolutely. like the Greeks. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. But for a thousand years, the idea of assimilation was impossible. Who would marry a Jew? Mm -hmm. You live in a certain place, you marry within that certain place, nobody wanted you outside. But come the Enlightenment, which was not a Jewish movement, mm -hmm. right? the Enlightenment swept through Europe. It was a, a movement of democracy. It was a movement of freedom of the spirit. It was a movement of equality of man. Right? And, of course, the Jewish side of it uh, was impacted very strongly. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, gates that had been closed were opened. The, the idea that a Jew could be an officer in a, a French army, that a Jew could sit on a Supreme Court in a Gentile court, that a Jew could be part of, you know, a government, uh, a member of parliament, not representing Jews, but as a independent member, running as a member. These were ideas that did not exist before the Enlightenment. It was out of the question. Okay. Now everything changed for the Jewish world. 
and the Jewish world had to deal with what were opportunities that didn't exist before, right? Mm -hmm. Also threats at the same time. Mm -hmm. Among the many progressive and modern values that they advocated was Jewish assimilation, which they believed was the only answer to anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, a large number of Jews grew up without the Shabbos, mm -hmm. without Jewish dietary laws because of this movement. Mm -hmm. The Haskalah movement grew stronger by the day, carrying off numerous souls who saw traditional Judaism as an ancient, outdated religion. We know that in Western Europe, Rav Hirsch was the, the major blockade against this with limited success, quite frankly. And from this, the reform movement sprung. Decades after this, its inauguration, the Haskalah movement underwent transformation. Many of its members, called Maskilim, decided to return to Judaism, albeit a brand quite different from the one their ancestors kept for thousands of years. Ever since its inception, Judaism had been defined as a religion. It may contain a significant number of national precepts, and nationalism may be an essential part of our faith, but it is primarily a religion. The newly enlightened Jews, this is important, however, gave Judaism for the first time in history a new definition. A nation with no binding connection to religion. One of these new-fashioned masculine, Theodore Binyomin Zev Herzl, raised in an assimilated home completely devoid of Jewish tradition, Herzl originally opined that we must encourage Jews to intermingle with Gentiles. Yeah. But the Dreyfus Affair changed everything. Captain Dreyfus was a Jew who was serving in the French army. He was accused of treason. He was clearly innocent. He lived and died his life on Devil's Island. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Herzl was at the trial. And he understood for the first time, there is no chance that they will ever let us be assimilated. Absolutely. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Not going to happen. The Dreyfus Affair made him, Herzl, realize this solution was doomed to failure. Yep. There's something about the Jewish people which Herzl could not pinpoint or explain that prevents it from assimilating. According to Herzl... Can I, can I, can I yes. interrupt you? It's about Jewish people or about nations not wanting to? Because it's Pretty much, you know, it's not only French, but at the same time, you know, Tsarist Russia wasn't running toward Jews neither. Yeah, he, yeah. his point is that... Is it about Jews, something wrong with the Jew, Jews, or something wrong with the nation, which has no, no, anti-Semitic... No, no, he's saying, he was observing something, mm -hmm. right? What he was observing is something that um, observant Jews and people who look back on history understand clearly. We may not know exactly what the reason is. We may have many different views of the cause of anti-Semitism, of the cause of Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe because we're the conscience of the world. Maybe because we're the canary in the, the mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because you know, you know, we have different noses than everybody else, which we don't. Uh, maybe it, it's because we wear plaid and they wear stripes. Whatever the reason. There seems to be the oldest hatred, continuous hatred in history, is a hatred towards the Jewish people. I don't want to go into detail what my opinion is of where that comes from, but Herzl realized that this is not something that will go away simply by not looking Jewish. Yeah. The hatred sometimes is directed towards religion. Sometimes the hatred is racial. Sometimes the hatred is national. Today we see the same hatred as anti-Zionism. Right? It's directed towards a nation of Jews, a pariah nation. Right? Yeah, the nation that is giving the world so disappear. much, yeah. and it's so foolish that the only explanation yeah. for it is irrational hatred at the end of the day. That's a pathology. Right? Um, so, Dreyfus <laughs> came to understand this, right? Mm -hmm. He came to understand yeah. that there is something, he couldn't pinpoint it, right, that prevents Jews from assimilating, right? We can look the same, but they always know it's us. You know, I tell the story over and over and over. I'll repeat it one more time for this class, right? 
is that there are a group of Catholics in Spain, mm -hmm. a very, very large group of Catholics, that became Catholics during the Spanish Inquisition, mm -hmm. 1492. Mm -hmm. That's over 500 years ago. Everybody knows who they are. And you know what they're called? Nuevo Christos, the new Christians. Mm -hmm. For 500 years, they've been practicing Catholics. Catholicism. And the Catholic community calls them Nuevo Christos, mm -hmm. the new Christians, new Christians right? Yeah. They're saying they're not really us at the end of the day. And we agree, by the way, actually. According to Herzl, the only solution to anti-Semitism and the discrimination was the establishment of a Jewish state. You know, we tried joining them, it didn't work, yeah. right? So what's the alternative? We need to have some community where we have security. Right? Not all the Muscalum agreed. Many continued with their attempts to assim assimilate as Jews, and some indeed succeeded, severing themselves from the Jewish collective eternally. The majority of those who retained their Jewish identity joined Herzl, forming a secular Jewish movement with the goal of establishing a Jewish state in Eretz Israel. Although the members of this movement had little connection to religion, they attached great importance to preserving the Jewish nation. They were even willing to sacrifice their very lives in order to build a Jewish nation and home. Quite unexpectedly, this secular nationalist movement succeeded where religious Zionism failed. Mm -hmm. And this is a very, very important statement. We, we need to understand this. And it's a peculiar statement that we're going to have to deal with and cope with. You have a group of Jews who sever their connection with the, belief, with the faith. They don't view themselves as practicing Jews. Mm -hmm. right? They view, view themselves somehow as like a nationalist body. But they're not connected to Shabbos. They're not connected to Kashrus. They're not connected to Torah in any way. Mitzvahs in any way. And yet, they view themselves as a cent cent central nationalist entity for whom they are willing to go to Palestine and give up their lives with to a, create a nation. With ideological, more and social uh, base. That is what it was, but, but it's a very curious thing. Mm -hmm. Because we're not talking about people saying, gee, you know, there's a job opportunity here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people who are saying there's a very good chance I may not make it. And by the way, we're not talking about people from very poor homes. Mm -hmm. Generally, these were well-educated yeah. children of okay. professionals, okay. right? You know, who didn't need to do this. They were doing this out of a very curious ideological movement, yes. right? That was not based on the Jewish faith, mm -hmm. as they understood it. Mm -hmm. right? This is very curious, I think. Mm -hmm. can, can I say something? There is a three three ingredients required for a Jewish nation in, in to be nation. You require land, Language. which land, Eretz Israel. You require nation, belonging to a nation, understanding that you belong to a nation. And they had it. And they had appreciation of land of Israel. Only thing they didn't have, it's Torah. But if you look at it from poor... They didn't have the land of Eretz Israel no, at no. all. Understanding what's required. For in their the theoretically, they, speaking, theoretically they felt themselves they as a part of the nation. There are three ingredients that uh, comprise the, uh, the whole... Body. They understood the land of Israel required. What we know they didn't have, they didn't have Torah. But what I would like to tell By you... By the way, they didn't the, begin with the land of Israel. Have, let let me finish my thought, guys. From the point of view of Kashrut... You know, it's a, it's a two out, two out of three, it's a majority. They had m ingredients for, uh, for, for a right approach to the, to the nation building. From Jewish, from, from halachic approach. You need la Eretz, you need nation, and you need Torah to build... But really, first of all, you understand that the early secular Zionist movement did not require Israel. They were not considered. You got it was a serious consideration. 
right? In the end, they decided on Eretz Yisrael for many reasons that, uh, you know, obviously God's hand is involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. You know, well, clearly. It doesn't mean that you're aware that God's hand is involved in it, but, it but clearly it is. But they considered many other alternatives as well. What they mm -hmm. believed was that we have to we have a build a nation. Mm -hmm. And Herzl's dream of a nation, by the way, I have to tell you, was very strange. You know, he didn't really think we were going to need a serious military. He thought that, the, you know, the, the ministers would all dress in tuxedos and high hats and, you know, they would, you know, have a formal government like they have in Vienna mm -hmm. and that, you know, other countries would come and send their representatives and... Mm -hmm. You know, everything was going to be fine. You know, it was the crazies like Jabotinsky mm -hmm. who said, you're going to have to fight for this and you're going to have to continue to fight for this. So this, was this, this, was, Olda, this was not yeah. utopian. Olda, uh -huh. she was exactly the same. Yeah. Till she came and they told her, you know what, excuse us, you're a Jew. And then she understood that yeah. she was exactly the same. The same as, like as what? As Herzl? Like Herzl. But she came from. I mean, where did she, she come from? She understood you know? that we need army, but she thought that uh, the working party within the, with the working party of, of Russia and the other international countries, the interna yeah. international, yeah. mm -hmm. was exactly the same. <clears throat> the Zionists, the Zionist cause gained momentum specifically from the direction of the seculars. The religious anti-Zionists found new theological reasons to oppose the movement. So remember, the original reason of opposition was really the impossibility of it, and then a theology was created around the impossibility mm -hmm. that said we're forbidden to do it halakhically. Now, once the Enlightenment came along, and you had secular Zionists, it was, aha! The proof that we've been right all along is look who wants to make make a, a country. People who don't keep Shabbos. Mm -hmm. You think that God is going to allow those people to create a nation? Who are you kidding? It can't happen. It won't happen. It never happened. Right? But it did happen. Rabbinic leaders had fought the Enlightenment movement even before it adopted Zionism. Now they voice new arguments against religious Zionism, raising questions that stand at the center of the debate until this very day. Would God really redeem his people when they are so far from spiritual perfection? Do we not say in our prayers we were exiled from our land because of our sins? How then can we deserve redemption when we still are steeped in sin? Does the Torah not state that Israel will repent for redemption? How can God possibly bring redemption through those sinners? Aren't the Zionists guilty of leading most Jews astray? Is this the state that we have anticipated from the past 2,000 years of exile? Is it not true that the Gedolim oppose Zionism? Does that not obligate us to follow their opinion? After all, the majority rules. The more pivotal question is, why does all this matter? What difference does it make, in the words of Hillary Clinton? <laughs> what difference does it make whether we, whether we are living through the redemption or not? Besides the issue of thanking God on Yom Atzmaut and Yom Yerushalayim, shouldn't we focus only on observing God's commandments? When Mashiach arrives, we will discover the truth about current events. Why then does the issue of redemption have such a profound effect on so many other religious issues. And this actually is a tremendously important statement because the laws of the individual and of communities mm -hmm. in exile is very different than analyzing a nation. Everything changes when it becomes a nation. Mm -hmm. right? We were never a nation for the last 2,000 years. Our halakha developed <coughs> in shtetls, in based dins, in mm -hmm. honored courts that we we had, but never, but never mm -hmm. as a sovereign country, right? which is where we began the process, right? And we were exiled from it. These and similar questions are all relevant and weighty today, as they were half a century ago. 
Even within religious Zionist circles, people are searching for clear answers. This book is intended for them. <clears throat> then this is a little note about some of the people really who were groundbreaking in this area, uh, but are often misunderstood. Can I can I ask a yes. question for you for go further? It means two Talmuds which we have, which both written in uh, exile. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Rishonim definitely. It's written in Yavna, Yavna, not in Jerusalem, under Roman authority. And what about the Shirano who was writing on the Surah Pumpidita in Babylonia? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's also in exile. Exile. Oh, yeah. 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 The, the, point, the, the, the both, famous both Talmuds, which we based our laws on, written in exile. It means both of them really based on the laws of living as a... You can't go too far with it, but yes, you're right. In the sense of, they're definitely they definitely are talking about how you manage to live without sovereignty, for sure, absolutely, and in communities rather than as nations. Definitely. For example, how did the Mishnah, by the way, is different, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the source of these things. The Mishnah was was created under uh, you know well, dates back to Moshe Rabbeinu, but also uh, you know as a sovereign people, but it was written down because of the destruction of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. It means now, for example, people who try to derive the law, halachic law, for a, for a nation, existing nation, with the borders, with the army, with, the, with everything, right. what they're basing it on? They're, they're like looking they're, for applications, right? And there are applications, right? For you know how you met, how they're, they're looking in case law in the Talmud, and they're looking at the Mishnah as, as a source. It was just recently right? about the subway. The, the discussion was happening in Israel about the train. Train. Yeah. train yeah. It's connected as a country or as a Shabbos. As a, how it's it, the, the, they the issue. Have to base it on no, the issue is this, and you're raising a very important issue. As long as our Rabbanim uh, our Rabbanim have one source from which to make decisions and that is previous Rabbanim. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest minds of 2,000 years composed Jewish law. Mm -hmm. Jewish law is the basis not just of Jewish law but many other legal right. systems as well. And it's a, it's a very fine system. Part of its strength is that it doesn't, it's adaptable, but slowly adaptable. Nobody anticipated that uh, overnight we would create a state. Certainly none of the Ravanam did, and most other people didn't. We dreamed about it, we prayed for it, we invested money in it, but to actually have a sovereign state, and we know that the creation of the state of Israel is a clear miracle. Yeah. You know, seven Arab armies attack this it's state, the next and they win. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody thought that it was going to happen. The Jews would be driven into the sea. Our enemies thought it, and our allies thought it. Right? Over and over and over, we have defied the odds, because God wants this to be, right. clearly. Right? But has the halachic process um, managed to keep up with the historical developments, I would say that it's running to catch up. We're going to actually talk about this now. It's interesting you raise it, because this is when Rav Cook comes into the picture. Right? Mm -hmm. so let's mm -hmm. Many people are familiar with Rav Cook's philosophical and Kabbalistic teachings. So Rav Cook, based on this, could be kind of dismissed. Utopian, a dreamer, a mystic, a poet. He is all of these things, by the way, but he is more. And thus, they mistakenly believe that his worldview is insubstantial, it's utopian, having no real basis in the realm of halacha. Because they do not investigate the matter thoroughly, people also think falsely that Rav Cook was isolated in his opinions, going against all the other rabbis of his time. Therefore, we have tried in this work to deal mainly with the concrete halachic side of the issues quoting primarily from the works of those who are not usually identified as Zionist rabbis. 
So let's understand what the basis of this book is and when we're going further. This book is not intended to be a philosophical, a historical, or a mystical explanation for the creation of Israel. Mm -hmm. There are all of those things extant. They're all legitimate. They're all valuable. It's not the nature of this book. This book is a halachic analysis of the redemption process and where the modern state of Israel falls in that area. It's <coughs> very solidly grounded. That's important to understand. Mm -hmm. I think there's one chapter that isolates itself from it. It's very interesting. But he's, the author specifically says you could skip this chapter if you wanted to. right? Because I don't want to deal a great deal with philosophy and mysticism. Mm -hmm. Naturally, many of the questions are interrelated, and some sources quoted uh, in the answers are similar as well. Additionally, I've tried to arrange each chapter such that it could be read as an independent unit. Therefore, some ideas may be repeated in different chapters, but I've tried to add new insights wherever possible. So this is the author explaining what's coming up and the method in which he applies it. And you'll see as we read on that sometimes... He repeats things because questions are asked slightly differently and the answers are similar, but he's giving you other sources at the same time and he's explaining that. The Ramban, Nachmanides, mm -hmm. writes that there are no irrefutable proofs or decisive arguments on any halachic matter. That's a troubling thought, I think. Mm -hmm. The same is true regarding the issues covered in this book. There is certainly room to debate the varying opinions and one can interpret the sources differently than we do. We're not claiming that religious Zionism is the only halakhically viable approach, nor is it our intention to engage in polemics and try to convince people who have different traditions to accept ours. And by the way, he uses an interesting term here, and I just want to pause for a second. Religious Zionism. Religious Zionism. Yeah. So we tend to think of religious Zionists as... Zionists who become religious. It's generally how we think of them. Some people use the term modern orthodox. A couple of different terms for it, right? I would hope at some point we'll be able to bring Menachem Begin into this story. Menachem Begin was a person who would not have considered himself to be religious. And yet... He founded the state of his his whole philosophical view on Torah, yeah. and he clearly stated it. He was a scholar; he understood it, and and he didn't deviate from the values of Torah. Did he observe Torah as we observe it today? Maybe not. Maybe not. But his view of religious Zionism was not about a Zionist who became religious. It was a Zionism that was infused with the values and the foundation of Torah values. Mm -hmm. And that could not move from that. Other nations could have their own reasons for independence. But the, the nation of Israel's national statehood was founded, in his mind, on values of Torah. Mm -hmm. That was his view of religious Zionism. And maybe we'll have a chance to go through his manifest on the subject. It's fascinating. People in our communities are asking many questions, either on their own or after speaking with friends and neighbors, and they want to clarify the issues. The purpose of this book is to demonstrate that our approach is firmly rooted in the foundations of traditional halacha and to provide explanations for those who follow it and want to understand it better. It is certainly possible to say that our viewpoint makes more sense than is more and is more plausible, but an absolute determination does not exist. One who studies this book in search of truth, not just in order to prove others wrong, will find deep-seated divine truth contained within. But people who feel that religious Zionist way of life is based on compromises in halacha, and an overall lack of devotion to Jewish tradition. Thus, another goal of this book is to affirm that God's Torah is the very essence of our lives. We are completely beholden to Allah, and our entire approach to divine service stems only from it. 
author who writes it? Who is the, the, the author? The, in this, the, author the, the, the author of this book, and I'm <coughs> glad you asked the question, right? Um, is Rev. Yaakov Moshe Bergman, uh, who was a Brazilian Rav, being asked these questions. And, and I want to mention that if you turn to, um, in the approbations, uh, to, I guess it's the third page, you'll note that the translation of this important work, which we're reading right now, is dedicated to the memory of our dear parents, David and Luis Kaplan and Sarah Kaplan. Uh -huh. Although they are now in their final resting place at Har HaMeruchat, we take great comfort in knowing that their grandchildren and great-grandchildren fulfill the mitzvah of Yeshuv Eretz Yisrael every day. May this book inspire Jews to strengthen their commitment to Torah and the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Israel and, Lu and Susie Kaplan. Yeah. Right. And this entire series really is in the, the memory of a great Sada, uh, Izzy Kaplan, who was among us for too short a time. So I think maybe we should hold here, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we finish the introduction, and we will begin next week with chapter one, Can Redemption Come About Through People Who Fail to Keep God's Commandments?